Hello, Forensic Science students. I am Mr. Williams, and welcome to Semester 2 of Forensic Science. And we're going to begin this week with talking about forensic toxicology. Let's get started. Okay, forensic toxicology. It is a discipline of forensic science that's concerned with the study of toxic substances or poisons to aid medical or legal investigations of death, poisoning, or drug use. Forensic toxicologists perform scientific tests on bodily fluids and or tissue samples to identify drugs or chemicals present in the body that may have contributed to a crime. The forensic toxicologist uses analytical techniques such as those used in hospitals or research laboratories to isolate and identify substances in the body. Toxicology requires knowledge of chemistry, biology, and analytical instruments. And I would add that physics can be used in forensic toxicology with a study called biophysics. Commonly tested toxins include alcohol, illegal drugs, prescription drugs, chemicals, poisons, metals, and gases such as carbon monoxide. There are a lot of things that they could test for. There's a, a couple of images over here. We have a um, guy performing a um, transfer of a liquid into another liquid. And below it, look at the candy on the left and then the images of candy on the right. So forensic toxicology could also be investigating accidental poisonings. Look at the gum on the top left, which is a candy, and the gum on the top right, or the square on the top right, which is a medication. So we got things that look like Skittles, and but there's a pill that looks like Skittles. We got something that looks like a Tic Tac, and there's a pill that looks like a Tic Tac. And we got some tamales, and there's something else that looks similar to it, and jelly beans. So a young child, may not be able to tell the difference of some of these things. I can't tell the difference between some of them. What are the objectives of toxicology? Well, one is establish if substances are present and capable of contributing to death. Okay, is it there? Well, is that enough to cause death? Two, establish if substances are present and capable of causing behavior changes. Okay, is something there in the body? Well, is that enough to make someone intoxicated? For example, uh, there are most types of, actually, most types of mouthwash contains alcohol. Okay, well, if you're using the alcohol, um, or excuse me, if you're using the mouthwash properly, the alcohol inside the mouthwash is not going to cause you to be um, act drunk, for example. You um, swish it around your mouth, you spit it out, and then you, you know, go on with your day. Um, now you could test that alcohol in the blood, but it would not be enough to alleviate you or to cause you to act buzzed or drunk, okay? And so they were to establish, is, is the alcohol there? Well, yes. Well, how much was there? Well, it wasn't enough to actually cause any behavior change. Or it could be the opposite. Yeah, it was there, and um, I can't believe this person could even stand up. Number three, the objective of toxicology is to establish if substances are present in quantities of normal exposure. So an interesting thing about um, people is there are different standards today of metals in drinking water, okay? In the past, um, lead, the metal was used in lots of plumbing and plumbing fittings. And as years go by, they get stricter and stricter because lead in no quantity is acceptable in the body. And so lead, what it does, it ends up um, migrating to your bones because your body doesn't have a way to get rid of it. So it just gets stuck somewhere. It gets stuck in your bone. You could take someone and um, like say you found some bones in the dirt. You could 
actually um, estimate what time period they were alive just by measuring how much lead was in their bones. And so we, are, we all have this normal amount of lead exposure. I mean, um, it's not okay that we're exposed to lead, but we get it from the environment just by being um, creatures on the earth. Um, but if there is a big amount, a large amount of lead in the body, you could say this is beyond the normal exposure. We've got an image here of some Flintstone vitamins. I remember begging for vitamins when I was a child because these Flintstone vitamins taste so good. And um, these contain iron, and iron is a, a very common poisoning for young kids. Okay, qualitative versus quantitative, some important Vocabulary words, qualitative analysis determines the presence or absence of a substance in a sample. So if you um, say, if you're testing for gold and you say, yes, gold is present, okay? That is a qualitative analysis. Quantitative analysis determines the amount of a substance that is present in a sample. So we think of the word quantity, that's how we get the word quantitative, right? So here we have a constitutional dollar. Uh, actually, this is a constitutional $50 gold coin and it contains one ounce of 0.9999% um, pure gold. Actually, 99.99% pure gold. You can get this, it's worth more than $50. Uh, it's hovering around $2,000 now, but that's what um, 50 constitutional dollars would actually be. I digress, let's continue. Okay, what kind of substances are tested? Well, first we got urine. Drugs are present in higher concentrations in the urine. Drugs will also remain in the urine for a longer period of time. Now this does depend on the kind of drug. Um, you could kind of simplify this in two ways. Um, a drug is either going to be soluble, like it dissolves. It either dissolves in water or it dissolves in fat, right? So if something um, dissolves in water, it would come out and it would be clear from your system much faster. If it is a fat-soluble drug, your body takes longer to, to get rid of and cycle through and clean up the fat. And so it would remain in your urine for a longer period of time. But urine is a good place to um, determine toxins. Blood um, is another great way to determine what's going on in the body, what you've been exposed to. And it's going to supply a toxicologist with a profile of the substances in the individual at the time that they collected it. Blood is the preferred collection method for blood alcohol content in drunk driving cases. And when you sign your driver's license, the state of Kentucky is a state where there is implied consent. So when you sign the driver's license, you have consented that on request of a police officer, when you've been pulled over and they suspect you of drinking alcohol, you consent to them drawing your blood. You can say no, but you will be arrested and you'll be taken down to the police station and eventually they'll draw your blood. And what is tested? Right? Hair is something else that's tested. Hair is capable of recording medium to long-term exposure to toxins and drugs. And this is why, because chemicals in the bloodstream may be transferred to the growing hair and stored in the follicle. Over here on the right, we have a image. Okay, we have the artery, which supplies the hair follicle with all the nutrients that it needs to produce and synthesize a hair. Um, and, of course, the deoxygenated blood, the blood that has all the CO2, um, it just leaves going up the vein. Now, as nutrients are being brought to the hair follicle, different chemicals, it could be a toxin, it, it could even depend on your nutrition, right? And, um, you can tell that in your hair. But it deposits these toxins as your hair grow, as your hair grows. So let's say your hair is, um, you know, you haven't cut your hair in three years and you have some really long hair. 
Well, that hair, if we cut your hair, we would have a record of what drugs you were exposed to or what toxins you were exposed to for those entire two years. Okay. And so we're going to say that there is a rough timeline of drug or toxin exposures that can be determined from hair samples. And right here in this image, you got somebody um, cutting a piece of hair. That's not how they do it. Like if you're getting hair drug tested, they shave down to the uh, to the scalp. I mean, you could if you shaved your head and said, "I'm going to get away with it." How long have you had your eyebrow hair? All right, um, they they could find samples that you've had for a while. Since hair grows about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half a month, different sections of the hair can be um, can give estimates to when a substance was ingested. Um, there is a problem with this because the darker and thicker a person's hair is, the more drug that will be found in the hair. Well, if it's thicker hair, it makes sense. There's more hair there, and so you would expect um, more uh, toxins to be deposited as it grows because it requires more nutrients and more toxins would be put there also if there's more nutrients required um, and the the darker the hair so if you have black hair um, for some reason which i'm not totally sure why but if you have black hair as opposed to blonde hair two different extremes the darker your hair is the more toxins that are going to be put there and so that can put people at the disadvantage just by having um, thick black hair that could mean that um, drug tests that use a hair sampling would be more sensitive for individuals with dark and thicker colored hair. Um, so you might be at, a, at an advantage if you have a lighter colored hair, but the best way to um, not have drug toxins in your hair is to not do drugs, right? The liver is the primary solid tissue sample in autopsies because it's where the body metabolizes most drugs and toxins. So when I say the body metabolizes, metabolizes these drugs and toxins, they transform them from poisons to, to something that can be gotten rid of without damaging the body. Many drugs become concentrated in the liver and can be found even when there are no levels in the blood. That's why you hear in a lot of medical commercials when they're advertising some prescription drug um when they when they say all the side effects really fast one of the things you'll hear is do not um do not take this medication if you have a history of hepatitis or liver disease and they'll just talk about the liver and that's because the liver does all the work of getting most of the toxins out of the body so there is a limitation to liver testing and that is that drugs are not uniformly distributed throughout the liver um, the liver is very specialized. One part of the liver um, does one job and a different part of the liver does another job. So um, it is literally kind of hit or miss. And if they're going to um, take, um, they want a good representation of what was going on, they'd probably have to take multiple samples. All right. So this word is called the vitreous humor. The vitreous humor is the clear jelly that fills the middle of the eye. So you think of the water that's filling up your eye, right? But it's more of a jelly. This is of particular interest in motor vehicle trauma, workplace accidents, suicides, and homicides. And it's real useful in cases where the body is um, very decomposed. Um, I'm not too sure on how they do this, but I do know that uh, this information is true. So there's a lot of other bodily samples, other fluids, organs, or tissues collected during autopsy can provide useful information, right? And sometimes they collect from dead people and they collect from alive people. The content from the stomach or digestive tract are useful for detecting undigested pills or liquids that were ingested prior to death. Common organs used for toxicology are the brain and the spleen. Very interesting. Um, Obviously, um, semen um, is a common uh, bodily sample that's used during uh, rape, um, rape cases. Um, 
if a woman is raped, um, one of the worst things they could do, this sounds gross. It is gross. Doesn't sound gross. It is gross. Um, one of the worst things you could do after being raped is take a shower. Uh, the first thing you should do is, you know, call 911, get to the hospital. And uh, you want to get a rape kit swab. You want them to collect the evidence so they can hopefully find the evil person who perpetrated the crime. But the common and the instinctual thing that you would like to do is just like clean yourself and just shower and just get anything out of you. But yeah, um, semen is another thing that is collected. Okay, so warning, the next slide has graphic image from an autopsy where the contents of the stomach were analyzed. You're gonna see like a hum human um, stomach that was taken out and you're gonna see the contents of this stomach, okay? All right, at this point, you do not have to continue and see this image. If you don't want to see it, um, you you don't have to see it, okay? Um, like, this video is over. If you don't want to see it, stop watching this, okay? So I'm going to change this slide in five seconds, okay? I'm going to do a countdown. If you don't want to see this, end the video. Five. Four, three, two, one. So this is a stomach that contains pills from an overdose. So um, somebody had apparently overdosed on some pills. And you can see that there is a variety of pills inside. Uh, there looks to be maybe bile inside. I'm not sure if that is bile, which is a secretion of the gallbladder. Or maybe those are, um, that's powder from pills. Not really sure, but this is an example of what a toxicologist would do. Um, more specifically, this was probably done by a medical examiner, and they were uh, viewing the contents of the inside. Guys, that's it. Um, Okay, um, that's it. That's all we're going to um, talk about in this lecture, guys. I hope you learned something. Thank you for watching, and make sure to get your assignments done and get them done on time, and don't forget to come to class, all right? Have a nice day, guys.